Welcome back, everybody, to the Metropolis Bulldogs Team Builder Dynasty here on NCAA Football 14. Today we have an opportunity to make history. As we wrap up the regular season here in year number five, our Bulldogs have an opportunity to position ourselves to compete for a national championship. We're the number five team in the nation with a record of 6-0. and We've got six more regular season games today, and depending on how we play, we can not only clinch a spot in the conference championship, but position ourselves to play for the national championship. Our season really could not have gotten off to a better start in the last episode. We had some pretty tough Power 5 matchups, and we mopped the floor in all of them. Five of our six games were decided by at least three possessions. The only one that was closer was the Cincinnati game, and that's because the Bearcats made a nice little comeback in garbage time, so that doesn't really count. We do have a tough stretch today with six in-conference games, and we've got some good teams here like Temple, Memphis, Capital College, even Navy's not all that bad. So it's not an easy slate of games today whatsoever. As I was saying earlier, we could not have gotten off to a better start this year. The offense is clicking, the defense is clicking, running back D.D. Santander is in the Heisman race, even though he hasn't had a run longer than like 15 yards. So as I did some simulating, we were able to get a couple prospects to commit with athlete Dave Johnson during our week eight bye week. And then before week nine, we got center John Wilson. Even though Dave Johnson's an athlete, he's probably going to be a lineman. It listed him as a defensive lineman, but maybe he'll have good enough blocking ratings to be an offensive lineman. And then center John Wilson, he is a three-star. I really wanted to add some depth on the offensive line, and we have done exactly that with four of our five commits so far being linemen. So as we go into our first game of the day against East Carolina, this is probably the easiest game we have left on our schedule. As it stands now, we are number five. The only teams ahead of us are Michigan, Oregon, North Carolina, and USC. If we can play well today and hopefully some of those teams above us fall, we could put ourselves into the top two to three teams and, you know, with a win in the American Athletic Championship, if we were to make it, we could position ourselves to play for a national championship. ECU is led by junior quarterback Isaac Kiwi. They have a good pass game, but outside of their quarterback and their top two receivers, one of whom is hurt, the rest of their roster is pretty bad. So because of that, we should be able to win this game fairly easily and move on to 7-0. Since we're going through six games today, we will be playing two and simcasting four. Since this is probably the least interesting game we have the rest of the way, this is going to be one of these simcast games. If it gets close, we'll hop in, but I don't anticipate it will get close. I think we should have no problem against these guys at all, especially being at home. ECU would score a quick touchdown. I feel like that might be the first time all year we've trailed, but we scored 10 late, including an 80-yard touchdown run right at the end of the first quarter by Donovan Barrington. And then from there, we kept the good times rolling at 17-7. East Carolina would add a field goal. They're keeping it competitive, but we do lead now 24-10. And then in the second half, much of the same. East Carolina's offense is doing a good job of trying to keep pace, but it doesn't look like it's going to be enough. We're up by 11 with the ball in the fourth quarter. It looked like the game was over, but East Carolina would make some noise. They would eventually make it a one-score game here on this following possession, but it looks like it'll be too little too late as we will recover the onside kick and kneel the clock out. So we beat ECU 41-35, a little bit too close for comfort there at the end. The defense did not play all that well today, but we were still able to get the job done. A lot of big plays in this game. Shout out to Donovan Barrington with another 80-yard run. It seems like he gets an 80-yard gain about every week at this point, whether it's on the ground or in the air or in special teams. Manuel Castillo was quite good. He completed 70% of his passes and seemed to avoid mistakes. Uh, we ran the ball really well. Didi Santander had another great game, and obviously Donovan Barrington is a big play machine. Those two guys continue to complement each other so well. Kemi Amendenigba had one of his best games of the season in the past game. And again, the defense wasn't great. We did send some pressure. We had a nice turnover with an interception from Figgy Yakabuti. So even though we allowed a lot of yards and a lot of points, we were still ultimately able to get the job done. But you're not going to win many games allowing 374 passing yards and four passing touchdowns. So hopefully the pass defense can clean it up a little bit. We're not going to face quarterbacks as good as Isaac Kiwi throughout the season. But we're also not going to face off against teams as bad as East Carolina. So we're going to have a lot less margin for error. Outside of the ECU, I think our next easiest game on the schedule is this one against USF. 
We're getting the easy games out of the way first, and then our last four games are against four, probably the six best teams in the conference. So this is another game we should be able to win pretty easily. USF is currently last in the division. They have a 2-5 and five record overall, 1-3 and three in conference. This game is on the road down in Tampa, Florida at Raymond James Stadium. So we do have to do a little bit of traveling. But again, USF is a lot worse than us. We should have no problem winning this game and advancing to 8-0. Before the game, we will get another highly ranked recruit to commit to the school in athlete Tariq Stevenson. I think this recruiting class is looking really good so far. These are going to be some of the core guys throughout the long-term simulation as we wrap up the series. He's got to be the pastiest Tariq I've ever seen in my life, but nonetheless, he can play the 38th ranked athlete in the country. He is definitely more of an offensive player, probably going to play wide receiver or running back at the next level. 91 speed looks pretty solid. He's 6'4", 231, so he certainly has the body and the frame to play wide receiver. So as we go into this game here against USF, again, they're not great. 2-5, and 1-3 and three in conference. This is a game that we should be able to win pretty easily. This team is more balanced than East Carolina, but they don't have as many like good players. Their starting quarterback is 68 overall, Joe Shaw, whose numbers are not bad for a 68 overall. The quarterback above him is injured, so that's why Shaw has had to play. And to his credit, he's done pretty well. So let's hop into this game here. Again, this is going to be another SimCast game because, well, USF is not all that good of a team. So I figured I would rather play the other games. Not a lot of people in the stands. I do see quite a bit of red. That's probably because the bleachers are red because this is where the Buccaneers play. But still, not a big crowd here whatsoever. So this is a game we should be able to win. As you guys know, Tails never fails. We're rocking our regular away jerseys, but with the alternate pants and the alternate helmets. This has quickly become one of my favorite jersey combos that we have. I wish I had, uh, you know, started to wear more of these creative jersey combos earlier in the series, but at least I kind of caught on to them now here towards the end. Uh, still a tied game at zero. Nobody scored in the first quarter. USF pretty close to the end zone. Then we would immediately respond with a kick return touchdown by Donovan Barrington, who has five or six at this point in his career. We would score again, and we lead by seven here going into half. We would force a turnover and add a field goal. Then we'd add another touchdown, and yeah, we are looking strong. 31 unanswered points. We can just sim out the rest of this game, and ultimately the Bulldogs would end up winning by the final score of 38-7 to with the last 38 points being scored by us. It was pretty close overall in the first quarter, and then after that, boom, the Donovan Barrington kick return uh, really gave us momentum, and from there we really didn't look back. So it's another strong win here for the now 8-0. Metropolis Bulldogs, who are continuing to play very, very well. Hopefully, this could maybe propel us into the top four or three teams, depending on what happens above us, because we are going to need some of those undefeated teams above us to start losing. Now, Will Castillo only completed 41% of his passes, but he also threw for four touchdowns. Santander and Barrington had both exactly 84 yards. CL Frost had probably his best game of his career. Seven for 112 and three scores. And then unlike last week, the defense was fantastic. They allowed the early touchdown, but other than that, they were phenomenal. We sent pressure. We forced turnovers. And obviously, Donovan Barrington continues to be the best kick returner in college football. USF's offense just didn't really have an answer for us. And their defense didn't really either. There's a reason why these guys only have two wins. So we have now gotten our two easy games out of the way. And now it gets a lot harder. We've got a really tough stretch against teams all above 500 in Temple, Memphis, Capital College, and then even Navy, who's pretty good. So we're going to start with this game against Temple. This is going to be one of the two games that we play today. Even if Temple isn't one of the two best teams left on the schedule, I wanted to play this game mainly because of the storyline of our former defensive coordinator, Louis Kahn, who is now the head coach at Temple. The Owls started the year off really well, but they have struggled so far in conference play. They're currently on a skid, putting them at 4-4 four and four on the season. So they are cold, but maybe they're looking for revenge. We've had a lot of close games with Temple throughout this series, and I'm sure defensive coordinator, or I guess our former defensive coordinator, Lewis Kahn, would love to beat us. We get a four-star quarterback to commit, Ryan Lawson. This is a big get for us. 
He is going to be the backup going forward to Rod Roberson, who is going to be the starter at quarterback next year and beyond. If something ever happens to Roberson or if he leaves early for a draft or something, then Ryan Lawson's going to be the guy behind him. He is pretty well-rounded, doesn't have any major strengths, but he also doesn't really have any weaknesses. He's just not as athletic as Rod Roberson, so because of that, I don't think he'll be as good, which is why he's probably not going to start for a while. So we are now number four in the nation. There are only three teams ahead of us. Temple is led by their running back, Malik Cooper. He wears 89. Why? I don't know, but he has 99 acceleration. Their starting quarterback, Johnny Jones, is hurt. Their backup quarterback, Devin Rivas, is also hurt. So they have turned to third stringer Javon Green, who is a 61 overall. Yeah, unlucky. You can't really blame Temple for their losing streak because they've had their two best quarterbacks go down and have relied on a two-star true freshman. In his credit, he hasn't been dreadful. He hasn't been good, but I guess you could ask for worse from a 61 overall. So here we go. Welcome to Metropolis Field here. The 8-0, number four ranked Bulldogs, the highest ranking in school history, are facing off against the 4-4 four four Temple Owls, led by first-year head coach Lewis Kahn, who has been the defensive coordinator here at Metropolis for the last four years. The Bulldogs opening up with the ball. Again, this is going to be one of the two games that we play in full. There's a nice 25-yard gain for Osiris Young. He gets the first down. Nice play by the senior wideout, who, of course, is by far the school's all-time receiving leader. Castillo on first down is wrapped up for a loss of five. Nice sack by the Owls. Another making a third and 12. Castillo goes up the middle for Rashawn Obendot, the senior wideout, who gets the first down. And the Bulldogs are moving it pretty nicely. They have it inside the 10. Pretty much a first and goal, but it's technically a first and 10. Castillo connects with Osiris Young for the touchdown. And the Bulldogs start this game off strong on the opening drive with an early touchdown. And it's 7-0. That'll bring out the Temple offense with 61 overall freshman Javon Green. His pass on third and inches is broken up. He tried to get it to Noble. So that brings up an interesting fourth and inches. They have the punt team out. But they're not actually going to punt. This would be a fake, and they got it. The fullback, Greg Price, gets four. The Bulldogs were fully prepared for the fake, but they didn't get the stop. So Temple gets to keep the ball after a gutsy fourth down call as it's second and 11. Green under pressure. He is rocked in the pocket. A big sack on the play by the senior, Delvin Hines, the second. That's his first sack of the year. Hines really hasn't been the same since his injury last year, unfortunately. Third and three for the offense. Castillo loses eight. He is wrapped up by Joey Jamison, and that'll wrap up the first. Seven-nothing start here for the Bulldogs. They look pretty good in the first quarter. We'll see if they can keep it going here as this game goes along. The Owls have it with pretty good fuel position as it's a third and six. Green again goes for the screen, and it's broken up by Jamil Cox. That'll make it a fourth and six. They're going to go for it again. Green looks to throw it under pressure. Short pass is caught by Fox, who is wrapped up by Cox and Jackson. Well shy of the first down marker, so the Bulldogs get the stop. And they get it back on offense as Castillo loses it, but it's quickly picked up by Garrett McCullough. That could have gone south real quick. So the Bulldogs have another opportunity after their near catastrophe as it's a third and seven. Castillo rolls out to the right, hopes somebody can get open, and he fires to the tight end, Georgie Bucciarielli, a native of just north of Philadelphia, as he gets it inside the 10. Third and goal now. Can Metropolis punch it in, trying to choose some clock with under 40 seconds left in the half? Castillo scrambles with it. He has Yun who drops the ball. Freshman Osiris Young back and better than ever with the drop as the Bulldogs are going to be forced to kick the field goal. Marquez Glover splits the uprights, and it's a 10-0 game. So Temple gets it back with 28 seconds, and I'm curious to see what their plan is on this drive, whether they want to run the ball, pass the ball. How about they turn over the ball instead? It's intercepted by Brian McGrew, the senior, and the Bulldogs are going to have another opportunity to score. He brings it out to the 35-yard line. So now Metropolis, with 17 seconds and all three timeouts, have a real opportunity to score again. Castillo on second and 10 under a lot of pressure, launches a dot into the hands of Rashawn Obendot, who gains 25. The Bulldogs call time, and now it's a first and 10 at the 10. We're going to get a three-score game going into halftime. Castillo looking for the end zone. It's caught. 
It's Georgie Bucciarelli with the touchdown. And Metropolis makes it a 17-0 lead going into halftime with 10 of those points coming in the last 40 seconds. Temple really blew it with the interception. And now they've got even more groundwork to do, trailing by three scores. Second and two, Green pitches it for Cooper with the stiff arm. Gets by Cream and Malik Cooper down the field. Brings it inside the 10 for a big run. Good play there for Temple as it's now a third and goal. We'll see if the Owls can punch it in the end zone. Green goes short for Noble, and he is short. So that'll bring out the field goal team. Temple's not going to be able to score a touchdown, but at least they get out of the shutout as it's now 17-3. to So the Bulldogs still lead by 14. They're definitely still in a good spot, but the offense and defense both have to keep this going, and that will certainly help. And then Panikba down the field. He gets 34 yards. Big play by the slot receiver, Kimmy and then Benigba. And the Bulldogs now have it on the goal line as it's Donovan Barrington, the senior running back who finds the end zone for the touchdown. Barrington's another Philly guy. He's from right outside there out in Westchester. So it's now 24-3. The Bulldogs extend the lead as a couple of Philly natives help put them on the board. Third and 15, Malik Cooper gets around three on the screen, wrapped up by Michael Roberson. Don't run screens anywhere near Michael Roberson. He knows how to fish them out easily. 24-3, the Bulldogs lead here going into the fourth quarter. Temple has nothing to lose. They're going to go for it here on fourth and 12, and they got it. Keon Hill gets around 15 yards. Good throw by the freshman, Javon Green. That'll move the chains. Second and 10 now for the Owls, who don't really have time on their side. If they want to come back, they've got to move quick. It's another screen for Cooper. He loses four, wrapped up by the freshman, Lucas Langley. It's not just Michael Roberson who knows how to sniff out screens. We saw Curtis Neal do it in the last episode. We're seeing Lucas Langley do it now. Fourth and 14, Green throws it away. He had a receiver wide open, but chooses to throw it to the sidelines instead. Why? I don't know. The Bulldogs would start chewing some clock. They would eventually add a touchdown here from the legs of D.D. Santander. It's now 31-3, and that's pretty much all she wrote. Temple's offense stalled out. The Bulldogs chewed clock, and they would end up winning this game 31-3. Good win here for Metropolis, improving to 9-0 on the season. Efficient day for Manuel Castillo, completing 70% of his passes with two touchdowns. Santander and Barrington were both very good again. Yanni and Bucciarielli were both very solid as well. And then the defense had another great performance after allowing 35 in the first game to East Carolina. We've allowed 10 in the last two weeks. Javon Green with a nice passer rating of 69. I guess he could have been worse, but he wasn't really good. Other than Keon Hill, none of the receivers really stood out, and their defense, for the most part, kind of struggled. They did get a couple of sacks, but other than that, not a whole lot to write home about here for the Owls. So we are 9-0, three games down, three to go. That starts with a rematch of the American Athletic Conference Championship from a year ago at Memphis. The Tigers are looking for revenge. We beat them last year, really ending their hopes of possibly getting into the national championship game. So the Tigers are out for blood. This Memphis team is not as good as they were a year ago, but they're still quite solid. They're 6-4, and four, they're right on the fringe of being a top 25 team, and they really want to win this game if they have a chance of staying in contention for the conference championship, as Tulsa in the other division is 5-0 and in conference, whereas Memphis is 3-3. Three and three. So we have now moved up all the way to number two. This whole national championship thing is no longer a pipe dream. It is in our sights. If we win out, we're probably going to be there. The only team ahead of us is USC. Northern Illinois also is undefeated at number three. So we now have a very real possibility if we win out, we have a real shot of going to the national title game, but it is not going to be easy here with Memphis, Capital College, and Navy, all of whom have six wins approaching us on the schedule, along with the conference championship game at this point, likely against Tulsa. There's a few teams right on our tail in the division, so if we lose an in-conference game, we might not even make the conference championship. As I said earlier, this Memphis team is not as good as they were a year ago, but they're still quite solid at 6-4. and four. They have had a hard time of replacing their superstar quarterback, Seth Hennigan, the NCAA's all-time leader in passing touchdowns. But Charlie McKinney, a redshirt sophomore, has done serviceable. And running back Mike Elbert has also done fine, replacing another first-round pick in running back Brandon Thomas. So although they don't have Seth Hennigan and Brandon Thomas anymore, this is still a pretty talented team. 
And most of these guys were on the roster last year, so they were there when we beat them in the conference championship here in Memphis. So these Tigers are looking for revenge. I really thought about playing this game, but I ended up choosing the Temple one over it, and I knew I was going to play against Capital College. So because of that, this is going to be a Simcast game, but obviously if it is close, we are going to hop in. We'll see if the Bulldogs can make it 10-0 against the Memphis Tigers. Memphis, if they want to make a conference championship, they got to win today. It's really that simple. If they don't win today, then I'm pretty sure Tulsa clinches a spot in the conference championship. Memphis adds an early touchdown. They would add another one. A big start for Memphis as it's 14-3 after one, and the Tigers would add another field goal. They are looking really good so far. Talk about revenge. We would add another touchdown, bringing it within one score. Then a field goal brings it within four. So we're making some noise here. We're starting to come back, but Memphis adds another touchdown. We would respond, and then they would respond. It's 31-20, to and we're in a very interesting scenario here in the fourth quarter. It's fourth and three. I decided to hop in. The team needs us here for this comeback. We're going to go for it here on fourth and three. Castillo rolls out to the left. I think he has running room, so he's going to get the first down, but he fumbles it. He got the first, but he lost the ball in doing so. So Memphis gets it back. They lead by 11, and they had the ball. The Bulldogs' undefeated season is in real danger, but not for long. This pass is picked off by Figgy Yakabuti. On the first play at the drive, Yakabuti picks it off. Both teams trade turnovers, so it's like nothing ever happened. The Bulldogs have it back with great field position as it's third and 11. Castillo misfires for Georgi Bucciarelli. The Tigers get the stop, and after all of that, the Bulldogs are going to kick the field goal. What they should have done on the original fourth down, they're going to do here. So it's an eight-point game. Memphis has it back. If the Tigers are smart with the football and can score... They should probably win this game. McCarthy backs up in the pocket, goes deep, and it's caught by Howe, who brings it past the 40. They gain there for the Tigers the exact start they needed here to this drive. As the clock continues to tick, it's a third and four. Handoff for Elbert, and he does not get it. He only gets around a yard, so that'll make it a fourth and three, and Memphis is going to keep the offense out of the field. They're going to go for it. I guess they just don't trust their kicker? Interesting decision here is McKinney's pass, if he gets it off, is going to be broken up by Michael Roberson. So the Bulldogs get the stop. They get the ball back down by eight. A touchdown and a two-point conversion can tie the game. Here's Didi Santander up the middle with a gain of 17. That is his longest run of the entire season, and that's not a bad thing. It's not like he's been bad this year. I mean, for Christ's sake, he was in the Heisman race two weeks ago. Second and seven, Castillo gets it to Young. Woo! Nice little spin move. He brings it all the way to the one. A gain of 31 yards for Osiris Young, and the Bulldogs can just taste tying this game. First and goal at the one. Back to Santander. He is in for the score, and the Bulldogs are a two-point conversion away from tying the game. What's the play call here? Do you run it? Do you throw it? Manuel Castillo's in shotgun. He's going to look to pass it. Rolling out to the right, and it is incomplete. There was nobody open. Perfect defense by Memphis, and the Tigers are going to keep the lead. Memphis has it back with another opportunity to finish the game, but that's not going to help. Charlie McKinney loses seven on the sack. He's wrapped up by Lionel Brothers. That'll make it a third down and 22. The Bulldogs' undefeated season on the line. Short pass for Elbert, and he gets seven. So the Bulldogs call their last timeout. They're going to have it with... Plenty of time to score, and all they need is a field goal to take the lead. First and 10, Castillo looks to throw it, and he is picked off! Raby with the interception, and the undefeated dream is over. The Memphis Tigers are going to upset Metropolis 31-29. to This game really stings. Right when we were number two, we lose. Manuel Castillo had a really strong performance, but the interception at the end really costed us. I don't think it was a bad read on that pass. I just think he might have thrown it a little bit too soon to where Bucci Ariely did not quite have enough separation on the defensive back. and He was able to make the play. Our defense was good in the fourth quarter. We stepped up when we needed to, but they weren't good enough early to give us enough room for the offense to dig out of. So Memphis does get revenge for us beating them in the conference championship last year, aided by the huge interception by senior corner Tyrell Raby. So just because we've lost 
doesn't mean the season is exactly over. Our national championship hopes and aspirations have gone way down, but I think there's a non-zero chance we could still get in the natty if things go our way. The Bulldogs have dropped to number eight in the nation as we face off against our rivals, Capital College, for Senior Day. This is a huge stretch of games for us against Capital College and Navy. The Flyers only have two in-conference losses, and Navy only has one. So it is a far from sure thing that we get into the conference championship, but if we win these last two games, then we will advance. So as we go into this game here against our rivals for Senior Day, as I said, we are now number eight in the nation. Seven teams are ahead of us, but I do see a path for us to move up. USC did end up losing, and they fell all the way to 13. So they took even more of a nosedive than we did. There are three ACC teams ahead of us with Miami, Clemson, and NC State. Only one of those teams is going to win the conference championship, and IU could very well lose, and then we need to hope a combination of Oregon, Michigan, and Florida go down. I know we've been talking about D.D. Santander in the Heisman race. He's no longer in there. But you know who is in there? Running back Jake Parks. I'm not sure how many of you guys remember this name, but we went after Parks in recruiting in year number one. We didn't get him. And instead, we got the Walmart version of Jake Parks in Donovan Barrington, who's been very good in his own right. But, wow, it kind of does sting to see Jake Parks being that good. So as we go into this game against Capital College, they're led by a great quarterback in Don Campbell who's injured. We're taking on so many teams of injured quarterbacks today. Lamar Bryant is the backup. He hasn't played a lot. I'm pretty sure the Don Campbell injury just happened. And it's a shame for them because Campbell's been phenomenal this year with a touchdown interception ratio of 16 to 2. So it's the final regular season home game for all of our seniors, but there's still a chance we host the conference championship, so it may not be the last. The very first recruiting class of guys, a lot of those players are seniors, guys like Manuel Castillo, Donovan Barrington, Rashawn Obendote, Garrett McCullough, Michael Roberson, Brian McGrew. Those guys were all in our inaugural recruiting class, and they're all seniors. Our redshirt seniors were the original true freshmen from the Season 1 squad, guys like Ibrahim Yoder, Rashawn Obendote. Delvin Hines for second, Jeremiah Moore, Curtis Neal, Ezekiel Ogungaria, Terrell Cream, and Carter Jackson. We also have transfer offensive tackle Chris Adams as well, who's a senior, is on third and eight. The defense gets the stop. That's a good start, and that'll bring out the Metropolis offense. Here's Manuel Castillo, the greatest Bulldog in program history, in his final regular season home game, connecting with Kemi Amembenigba, who gets a nice gain of 38 yards, and that'll bring the Bulldogs into the red zone as it's now a third and inches. Metropolis looking to punch it in. It's a handoff for Donovan Barrington, the senior running back who gets the score. Barrington continues to have a phenomenal season, and he continues to be one of my favorite players on this roster as it's now a 7-0 game. The Flyers have it back, 3rd and 12. Bryant on the screen for Hodge, and he's going to lose 5, wrapped up by Lucas Langley. I don't know why teams run screens on this defense. Our linebackers are super smart. They know how to catch those out quickly. The Bulldogs have it back. Castillo incomplete on 3rd and 10. Good pressure there by the defense. So Capital College has it back. First down here for the Flyers. Bryant looks to throw it under pressure, dancing in the pocket, and he gets sacked by nobody. But he loses five, running into his own lineman, Mark Sanchez style. That'll wrap up the first quarter, 7-0 lead. Good start here for Metropolis. We'll see if they can keep it going in the second quarter. It's an early third and 11 here for the Flyers. Bryant looks to throw it. Again, it's a screen, and again, they're going to lose three. This time, it's the senior Michael Roberson who brings him down. Bryant is averaging like two yards of completion. I mean, their play calling on offense has been really bad. The Bulldogs have it back, second and 10. Here's the junior CL Frost down the sidelines. He gets 30. A big gain for Frost. That'll move the chains after a penalty. It's a first and 20 now for Metropolis looking to make up some yardage. Play action fake. Castillo looks to throw it. He has a wide open man again. It's CL Frost. Back-to-back -back plays for Frost as this time he gets 29. Third and one on the goal line. Handoff for Barrington, and he does not get it. He actually lost a yard. Big play by Lehigh Sykes. So that'll make it a fourth and one. The field goal team is out. Interesting call not to go for it. Normally Isaiah Sparks is very aggressive, but hold on. It's a fake. Ibrahim Yoder keeps it, and he loses seven. So the fake ends up being a massive disaster. The Bulldogs... In hindsight, really should have just tried to punch it in with Didi Santander, who's a great power back, but okay. 
Third and nine, deep ball for Bryant, and it's broken up by Reed and the group. That's probably the first time today that Bryant's thrown the ball past five yards, and he threw it to two defenders. The Bulldogs have it back in the red zone now, second and four to sack, losing seven. Derek Foster brings down the quarterback, so that will bring out the field goal team. This time they actually kick it, and it is good from the junior Marquez Glover. So that will make it 10-0. Capital College has it back on second and seven. Bryant is throttled to the ground by Michael Roberson, and that brings us to halftime. A low-scoring game, 10-0. The defense is playing really well. Linebacker Michael Roberson's playing out of his mind. He has like nine tackles, I think, four for a loss, and now a sack. He's been a machine. First down, Castillo under pressure, connects with the tight end. Georgie Buccierielli, who will con convert past the 30. Nice play for Big Booch as it is going to lead to another first down. Following play, it's a play-action fake. Castillo lobs it up for Booch. Georgie Bucciarelli brings it to around the five. Back-to-back -back plays to the tight end, and now Metropolis has an opportunity to punch it in. First and goal. It's Donovan Barrington on senior day with the touchdown, his second of the game. Barrington continues to be an end zone magnet, and it's 17-0. Capital College is in trouble. They need a big run, and they're going to get exactly that to start the drive. A gain of 29 for Daniel Hodge. That'll move the chains and get a, finally, a big play for Capital College, who I don't think has had a play go longer than like 10 yards today. Third and eight, screen for Butler, and he gets five. That'll lead to another fourth down, and it looks like the offense is going to stay on the field. Capital College elects to go for it. Interesting play call here as Bryant looks to throw it. He goes short for Brown, who does catch it, but he only gets two. Big stop by the defense. I think it's Michael Roberson again, who just continues to be an animal today. Metropolis has it back, looking to extend the lead. Third and four, they're going to run another screen. Why didn't you know it? It's Santander, who is short. Capital College giving Metropolis a taste of their own medicine. That'll lead to a punt. The Bulldogs' offense continues to be honestly pretty underwhelming today, but the defense has been phenomenal. Here's Butler, gets by Crean. Down the sidelines, past the 40, and he's wrapped up at the 35. And so that'll end the third quarter. 17-0, the Bulldogs up. Capital College needs a big rally, but with how the Bulldogs' offense has played, I suppose it is possible. First and goal here for Capital College. Lamar Bryant goes short, and it's caught by the tight end, Kenny Brown, who gets the touchdown. So the Flyers are finally on the board as Metropolis' defense continues to be, for the most part, really good in this episode. Now the Bulldogs are looking at Chew Clock, third and seven. Barrington is well shy of the first down marker, only getting around three or four. So the Flyers are going to get it back. They're only down by ten. They could really pull this off if things go their way. That's not going to happen. The pass is intercepted by Kyle Ward. A huge turnover for the Bulldogs, and from there it looks like Capital College's chances of winning this game are pretty much over. The Bulldogs would choose some clock. They would add a touchdown here from D.D. Santander, and that would pretty much wrap it up. 24-7, a good win here on Senior Day against our rivals, especially coming off a loss a week ago against Memphis. The Bulldogs improved to 10-1 on the season. Hopefully beating a good team like this can gain us some favor with the poll makers. And, you know, if we're lucky, maybe move up a spot or two because we, uh, we, we could really use it. Overall, the team played pretty well. The offense wasn't great, but they were efficient. They avoided mistakes. Other than the, honestly, really dumb decision to fake the field goal in the second quarter, the offense was super efficient, and we, as I said, avoided mistakes. And well, Castillo, no turnovers. We didn't ask him to do a whole lot, but he was very productive. Barrington and Santander with the same amount of rushing yards again. Barrington's a little bit banged up, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. Hopefully, he'll be all good. He did play really well today, scoring twice. Bucciarelli was our best receiver today, five catches, 75 yards. But it was the defense who won us this game. Michael Roberson was a machine, 15 tackles, four for a loss and a sack. We had that big interception by Kyle Ward, which pretty much iced the game and helped us get the win. Capital College's passing game was super stagnant. Lamar Bryant, 14 of 17, 51 yards. 3.6 average yards per completion is horrible. His longest pass of the day, 11 yards. That's pretty disgraceful. I thought they did an okay job running the ball. They had a couple big runs from both Hodge and Butler. Butler only had one carry. It went for 32. But this is what I have issue with. So Brown, eight catches, 45 yards. The running back, four for negative six. 
And then only two other players caught the ball for a combined total of 12 yards. That's just not going to cut it. They ran a bazillion screens, and against our defense, that's not going to win you many games. So we are now 10-1 and on the season with one more game to go against Navy, who is red hot. They have won like five or six in a row. They are playing some great football on the road in Annapolis, Maryland. It should be a pretty big challenge for us, but we do need to win this game if we want to advance to the conference championship. Just like us, Navy has only lost one in-conference game all season long, and this is their last in-conference game of the year. They do have one more matchup, obviously, against Army, who's also really good this year. I'm pretty sure Army is actually even better. They're in the top 25, I want to say. We had another player commit to the program in linebacker Jamar Stuckey. We were in a pretty tight battle, I believe, with Miami in order to get Stuckey, but they kind of fell out of the running for no real reason, but that means we're going to get him. Very well-rounded player. I think he's going to be a good in run support and in coverage. He's more of an off-ball linebacker rather than an edge rusher. Certainly an addition that we will certainly welcome. So we have moved up from 8 to 6 in the top 25. A few teams ended up losing. Northern Illinois is still number 1. And then Miami, Oregon, Clemson, and NC State are ahead of us. So Michigan and Florida both lost. That's really good. Again, only one of those ACC teams is going to win the conference championship. So I would like to think we could hop up to three or four worst case if everybody else wins out. We have to win this game first here against Navy. This is essentially the American Athletic East Championship because the winner will face off against Tulsa in the conference championship as a whole. This is the point of the dynasty where the military schools become really good. It usually takes a few years, but eventually Army and Navy start to become real powerhouses and that has been the case this year. Both of those teams have eight wins. We have a few guys banged up. Uh, Donovan Barrington, Jared Martinez, and Chris Adams are all probable. Those are three offensive starters, so we could really use them. We are also a level 20 with Coach Isaiah Sparks, meaning we can now use Insta-Commit, or we can start unlocking that. So that'll be fun for the long-term sim, where we will have Insta-Commit available to us. So here we go, the final game of the day. This will be a SimCast game. If I knew that this was going to be the division championship, I would have played this over one of the other games. But I actually don't mind SimCasting it because it gives our team a test without me being able to help them, pretty much, unless it's super close at the end of the game. As much as this series relies on me playing, there's a lot of simming. So I think having a super important game like this simmed can actually really show how good this team is without me, you know, helping in the game. So we're going to sim out this game here. Hopefully we can win and advance to the conference championship. And from the start, we would score a quick touchdown, make it at 7-0. Both sides of the ball looking good early. The offense is moving it well again, and we have an opportunity to make it a two-score game. Now we're going to make it a 13-0 lead, and from there, the offense would just keep piling on. We almost scored at the end of the half, but the defense has been fantastic, and we are really starting to turn this game into a blowout. It's 20 to nothing, make it 27 to nothing, and then 34 to nothing with a 50-yard run by Donovan Barrington. Navy would score late, but it's not going to matter. This game is all but over. 44 to 7, a dominant victory here against the Navy midshipmen, which will propel the now 11 and 1 Metropolis Bulldogs into the American Athletic Conference Championship game. This was definitely a big statement win for us, but again, it was about the run game. Didi Santander, 142-2. Donovan Barrington, while injured, with 189-2. So we gave Navy a taste of their own medicine by running the ball down their throat. Osiris Young was also very good for us in the pass game, and Navy's offense was just not good. Their defense was not good either. We just absolutely demolished them. We have two more players committing before conference championship week with corners Dustin Mack and Brett Crosby, both of whom are 73 overalls. Mack is ranked a lot higher than Crosby, but they're both the same rating, and I think they're both quite solid. So we are still number six, simulating into conference championship week as we get another player to commit in running back Ali Brewster. He's more of a power back type of only 80 speed. I think he could be a good short yardage guy. So overall, we have a good recruiting class going into the offseason. It's ranked fifth in all of college football with eight four-stars and three three-stars. And the three three-stars are three of the best players on the board, in my opinion. We still have eight players left who we're going to go after in the offseason as part of the long-term sim. So we now have Tulsa on the schedule here for the conference championship, led by 99 overall quarterback Baron Morton. We're still number six in the nation. Those five teams are all still ahead of us. 
So we need a lot to happen for us to make the national championship, but there's a non-zero chance that it happens. And that starts with us going into the Tulsa game and then winning. We do get to play at home, so our guys get another game at home. And if we can play well enough in that game to prove to the committee that our Memphis loss was a fluke, then maybe, just maybe, we can hop into the top two and play for a national championship. That'll be in the next episode. I hope everybody enjoyed. Make sure to like and subscribe. Peace out.